Well, we are in a series called Questions from the Congregation. And Warren, what is the question you want us to talk about this morning? Dear Paradox family. Oh, let's try it again. Here we go. Dear Paradox family. Dear Craig, my teacher, my question is very simple. Is the Christian nationalistic political movement Christ-like? All right, here we go. <laughs> is the Christian nationalist political movement Christ-like? Now, when Warren asked this last week, I immediately thought, well, there's going to be a disclaimer at the beginning of this sermon. This sermon. <laughs> and the disclaimer is this. I cannot give a sermon in which everyone here is happy. Not only that, I don't think I can give a sermon in which you, each one of you, would say, I agreed 100% with what Craig said today. So I'm asking you to let go of this idea that for this sermon to help you or to be of any benefit to our community, we have to agree on everything going forward. Instead, this whole conversation is about how we live in a world with politics. This whole conversation is about how we live during an election year. This whole conversation is about what it means to be Christian when there are people who think things differently than us, right? And so this is the disclaimer. Our goal this morning, 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 morning is not uniformity. Our goal this morning is to talk about the things that are worth talking about, even if we, aka me, make mistakes along the way. Does that sound good to all of you this morning? All right, the rest of you I'll get by the end of the sermon, I hope. Is the Christian nationalist political movement Christ-like? To answer this question, I actually want to take this piece by piece because I think it's worth answering and analyzing each of these different parts. I promise, though, this sermon will have at some point a yes or no to this question. So just yes. buckle up and get ready for that. Let's start with the word political, shall we? Now, I want to talk about my politics, which is typically a taboo subject. But the reason I want to do that is I want to share my political views with you to eliminate any guessing games. The point of this sermon is not to say, I think Craig's part of that political party, or I wonder if Craig's voting for that candidate. That's not what we're doing here. So I want to give you my personal context, not to tell you how to vote or what party to belong to, but just so you know where I'm coming from, so you don't spend the rest of the sermon trying to figure that out. Let me give you a little bit of a backstory. Back in the year 2005, I was living in a place called Bozeman, Montana, with someone who's actually here today, Darren Wilkins. I cannot believe he's here on the show when I talk about that. So I actually took a road trip from Darren's house in Bozeman with my brother across the country. We stopped at uh, Mount Rushmore, and this guy right here, 2005 Craig, was 100% Republican. Always voted Republican, always thought Republican was the way that God wanted us to vote, and absolutely believed it, right? Then in 2008, something interesting happened here in California, and the fact that the Supreme Court passed and legalized same-sex marriage in the state of California, but then, but then that year, they uh, put a proposition on the ballot called Prop 8 that was meant to repeal the same-sex marriage that was legal in California. Now, I have talked about this before in this community. This is part of my story. I voted against same-sex marriage in 2008, but all of a sudden I had this inward reflection where I thought, why did I vote that way? And so I said, if I'm going to be a pastor, I better understand what the Bible says about same-sex sexual activity and same-sex sexual attraction and be an authority on this if I'm going to continue to continue this first. So this, in 2008, that question launched a huge Bible study that lasted for years and years before around 2013, 14, I started to say to myself, I think I would officiate a wedding for a queer couple because that's what Christ would do. So uh, that was around 2013, and all of a sudden I started noticing all the verses and the stories that talked about the people who were marginalized in society. And I read the writings of Isaiah, who talked about how it's the widow and the orphan that we need to look after. And it changed the way that I viewed politics and how I voted. I started becoming more aware of how people, uh, what my votes benefited, who they benefited, and who they hurt. And so in 2016, after one certain candidate started to run for office, I, for the I first time in my life, I voted for the Democrat nominee for president. And, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but she lost bad. Um, and it was a bit devastating, that, that four years that happened after there. 
And then in 2020, um, I voted for Joe Biden. Um, I was a registered independent, though, because I thought that was the best thing to do. However, I was a little disappointed that I only got a provisional ballot to vote in the primary. Um, and as the years went by in 2023, I registered as a Democrat so I could get a non-provisional ballot so I could vote in the primary because I was convinced that Joe Biden was way too old for the office. Um, so I did a write-in vote that didn't go anywhere, but hey, I did my duty. <laughs> Uh, and I've been a registered Democrat for about a year now. I tell you this not because I need you to be a Democrat. I tell you this not because I think the Democrat Party is perfect. I do this because I want you to know something about me and the way that I view politics. For me, um, principles are far more important to me than parties. And uh, I do not say, well, we have a team, and this team's good, and that team's bad. No, I think it's important to celebrate uh, accomplishments that have advanced the principles that I find valuable and celebrate those and remind ourselves that this was not always this way, right? I think about in 1970 when Richard Nixon uh, signed into action the Environmental Protection Agency. Most people are not aware that the EPA was a Republican-led initiative. And it's something for us to remember because the EPA is something that I think is very valuable to our world, to our nation, and it was led by a Republican president. In 1988, while uh, Democrat-led Congress um, pressured or voted this through, Ronald Reagan did sign the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which gave reparations to Japanese Americans for wrongful internment in World War II. I'm a big believer in reparations, particularly for African Americans, and the way that we have treated, uh, the way that the economy has played out in the past. So this reparations has happened, and it was signed into law by a Republican president. In 1990, George H.W. Bush, as a Republican, signed into law the American with Disabilities Act and allowed uh, people who had disabilities to participate in society. It completely changed the field of architecture. I mean, if you go to architecture school, they talk they about rise the over run. They talk about all the different ways that you have to accommodate wheelchairs and different um, disabilities. And the benefit is everyone who has a disability can now participate in society. And so for me, it's much more important to celebrate these principles than it is to celebrate a party. So I just wanted to give you that social political context for me so that way you don't spend the rest of this sermon trying to figure that out. So with that out of the way, um, I can now say I'm going to move to these two words here, which are Christian nationalist. Now, a few years ago, Christianity Today ran an article which said, what is Christian nationalism? And I liked the definition that the author had in this article. He said, the Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Now, I want to be very clear and very upfront about something. At Paradox, we unequivocally reject the ideas and teachings of Christian nationalism and denounce Christian nationalism as a sin, period. Amen. Now, these may seem like, all right, thank you. <laughs> these may seem like harsh words, right? Very black and white, not a lot of wriggle room. Where do I get the idea that we can talk this bluntly about Christian nationalism? I get it from the Bible. Because in the Bible, there are 10 commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the ninth of which says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. While this commandment was given primarily for legal context and not lying under oath, I think that what Christian nationalism requires for anyone who subscribes to it is that Christian nationalism requires one to bear false witness to the words of the Bible and to the facts of American history. And if your neighbor is Hindu or Muslim or atheist or any other religion, it is at the expense of your neighbor that your lies come forward, yeah. right? And so I want to point out how Christian nationalism requires one to bear false witness, first with the Bible and then with American history. Let's start with the Bible. I've been preaching now for 16 years, which sounds like it's been way too long. And during those 16 years, nine years of my life was dedicated to going through every book of the Bible. I've been ordained, I have a doctorate in, uh, uh, in ministry, and I have gone through each of these different books of the Bible. And you know what I have found after this book cover to cover? 
There is zero scriptural support for Christian nationalism. It's not a concept that exists anywhere within the Bible. And while someone could technically justify it outside of the Bible and be fine, anyone who tries to cram in the idea that God somehow had some special country 2,000 years in the future, um, that just doesn't exist anywhere within Scripture. Now, some people say, well, I, th I think that when God is talking about the people of God or there's words in the Bible that say the nation of God, uh, he's they're talking about America. My response is never are they talking about America. Instead, all of the verses about a chosen nation are about Israel or Judah. And to say that it's talking about the United States of America just completely ignores the context of Scripture and the people who wrote it. If we go on, uh, the important thing to understand about the Bible is the Bible is not written by the powerful people in world history. Instead, the Bible is written from the perspective of people who are oppressed by an empire, the disempowered. While there are stories of David and Solomon where it appears that there is a big empire that Israel has become, uh, there's not a lot of archaeological evidence that suggests and supports that Israel under Saul, Saul, sorry, David or Solomon was as grand as the Bible claims it to be. Instead, those stories were written several hundred years after they happened, and they were written by people who always lived in the shadow of an empire, waiting for the empire at any moment to unleash their global military superpower and destroy them. Now, if you want to get specific, the book that I would point you to if you want to debunk Christian nationalism is the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel's thesis is that empires will come and go, but God will reign forever. And, and we talk about what that means in regards to the United States of America. It's something that every Christian believes, and this just very basic logic instantly undermines Christian nationalism. After all, we as Christians believe that God existed before the United States of America, right? We believe that God exists during the United States of America, yes? This part's not as popular. We believe that God will exist after the United States of America, right? And what this means is that God is bigger than the United States of America. Anytime you take a country and say it's God's will, you are always lowering God to be contained within one country. And so it is always, always, always a reduction of who the infinite God is. And when we talk about Christian nationalism, being a false witness to the words of the Bible, there is nothing within Scripture that would support this idea. It is actually anti-empire, the Bible is, and the United States of America is an empire. It is a global military superpower. And you have to change the words of Scripture in order to justify Christian nationalism, which is why we say it is to bear false witness to the Bible. Let's move to American history, shall we? A long time ago, in the year 1776, a man named Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. While the words Jesus Christ are nowhere in the Declaration of Independence, there are four references to a divine being, or God, right? This was 1776, and while the Declaration of Independence was good, it wasn't a constitution. That process of writing the constitution unfolded after the Revolutionary War was over in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And this Constitution was ratified in March 4 of 1789. Nowhere in the Constitution does it mention God. And that was not a mistake. It was a giant debate. It was a big discussion. It was a long, long back and forth process. But at the end, the Founding Fathers decided that God should not be in the Constitution. God should not be written into the Constitution because they had this sense that in order for a nation to be a place of free religion, you had to have a government that was free of God written into the Constitution. Now, this may not sound like convincing enough evidence, but without a doubt, the most obvious example that there was this whole idea that uh, the nation was founded on Christian principles, the fact that it was condemned very strongly happened just a few after years after this in the fact that during George Washington's presidency, he was negotiating a treaty with the nation of Tripoli. And while he didn't finish the negotiation, he handed off it almost completely to his successor, which was John Adams. And John Adams took this treaty to the members of the U.S. Senate, and the U.S. Senate unanimously ratified this treaty with the nation of Tripoli. 
I cannot imagine the Senate unanimously ratifying anything at this point, right? right. But they voted 100% to ratify this treaty with Tripoli. And in that treaty are these words, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. They wanted to make it clear, clear when they were making treaties that we are not going to just come in and evangelize you. We are separate. Jefferson always talked about a wall of separation between church and state. And so when I look at words like this, we have to point out that the idea that the United States of America was founded as a Christian nation is demonstrably false. You can find evidence after evidence pointing to the fact that while some of the founding fathers identified as Christian, there was this strong sense that this should not be a Christian nation, but instead should be a nation where people are free to worship as they so choose. Now, if anyone here is having a hard time with what I'm saying, just thank you for staying with me so far. What I want to say to you, though, is I'm not, not saying to you that you have to hate America. In fact, I want to talk about your relationship with God and your relationship with America. I want to encourage each and every one of you to love your God. You can love your God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. This is what we want here at Paradox, right? And as much as people may feel that sometimes I go against America, I do love this nation, and I want to encourage all of you to love this country as well, as imperfect as it is. And you can love your God, you can love your country, but this love should never be dependent on your patriotism, right? Your love for God should never be dependent on how well your country's doing. Vice versa, your love should also never be dependent on your faith. Your love for country should never be dependent on your relationship with God. Love both of them, but love them separately. When they become intertwined, it gets very messy very quickly. And I will tell you what I have learned in my life is that it never, never works out well. So that's what Christian nationalism is, and we had to talk about it bluntly in order to move to this last word, which is Christ-like. Now, when we say Christ-like, which I love that Warren asked this way with this word, we are referring to, of course, Jesus Christ. Now, as we have talked about here at Paradox often, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Instead, Jesus Christ refers to someone who is fully human and fully divine. And the name Jesus, Jesus refers to his humanity, and the name Christ refers to their divinity. So, are the Christian nationalists actually Christ-like? Well, to talk about that, we have to acknowledge that Jesus was not raised in a political vacuum. Jesus lived with politics as well. You see, Jesus lived in a time when the Roman Empire, based in modern-day Italy, ruled over his homeland of Judea. And while he was in Judea, the politics of his day looked something like this. There was an emperor in Rome named Tiberius. And Tiberius would appoint governors that would oversee different regions around the Mediterranean Sea of the Roman Empire. And the uh, governor that he appointed over the region that Jesus lived was a man named Pontius Pilate. Now, both of these guys are Romans, and the Romans learned very quickly that if you want to maintain an empire, you don't come in and have the Romans tell everyone what to do. Instead, you co-opt some people from, that are local, you give them a bunch of power, and you say, you as well as their own, go tell them what Rome wants them to do, but why don't you convince them on our behalf to help quell rebellions? So because of that, there was a puppet king named Herod Antipas, who was the Tetrarch of Galilee, and then there was also the high priest of Jerusalem, which was Caiaphas, and the high priest's priest, civic office, not just a religious office at this point in Jesus' life. Now, when you consider that this was the political structure of Jesus' day, the question that we, uh, or the thing that we need to also point out is that as long as Herod and Caiaphas, two Jews from Galilee, from Jerusalem, as long as Herod and Caiaphas were loyal to Rome, quelled rebellions, and kept taxes rolling in, Rome granted them autonomy. Rome didn't really care what they did as long as the taxes were coming in and nobody was fighting back. Rome said, great, go ahead, knock yourself out. Now, when we talk about taxes, the question is, who are the people who are being taxed at this point? Well, people like Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was taxed over and over again in his, again. In his life as a professional carpenter and often had to pay taxes to the empire of Rome. 
And while Herod Antipas and Caiaphas oversaw this from a Jewish perspective, they would go to local villages and hire people to collect the taxes. And the reason this was very, very deviant. They would go to a local in a village and they say, we want you to be a tax collector. It's a very lucrative position. You go to your friends, your family, you know, the people who won't fight back, and you tell them that they owe taxes to Rome. Oh, and by the way, you can, add, you can add as much of a tax collector fee as you want to those taxes and pocket it for yourself. Now, you have to feel the emotional weight of this whole system because this was not some faceless person from the IRS showing up at your door saying, I'm here to text you, collect your taxes. This was instead your brother, your son, your uncle, your best friend, knocking on your door, collecting exorbitant taxes, and then pocketing more money from you into their own bank account. This was a system that was called tax farming, and it was something that really, really roiled and rankled the people that were living in Galilee. Their own friends, their own family members were selling them out for their own profit to the empire of Rome. Now, as I said earlier, it was exorbitant taxes. I have seen scholars suggest a number of different percentages of income that was taxed and taken away from people working in Galilee at this time. The lowest estimates I've seen are 70% of their income and the highest are 90% of their income. We get mad when we have to do about 33%, right? Imagine being taxed 90% of your income. So Jesus lived in a political world. And while there were not two parties in Jesus' day and age, there was Rome, and there were the people who did not like Rome, right? And all the people who were Rome are the people who are getting paid and making money off of this system, and all the people who are anti-Rome, who are trying not to start a rebellion but are getting frustrated, are people like Jesus of Nazareth. And as Jesus of Nazareth and the people around him in Nazareth looked around, they saw their friends, their countrymen, their, their, their brothers become tax collectors, and they said, what can we do to get back at this tax collector? And they weren't going to fight back at him because this is their brother, this is their friend. They weren't going to go and, and, them and rob from them. Instead, the only form of protest Jesus and his fellow compatriots had was to treat the tax collector with social isolation and to say, okay, we're all going to agree that no one goes over to Billy's house. We're all going to agree that no one invites Billy over for the holidays. Until Billy gets so lonely, he renounces his tax collecting ways. Until then, we're going to make sure that Billy has no friends at all to send a message that we're not tolerating this. So this was the protest that everyone in Jesus' day and age agreed on. Now, with that political stage set, I want to tell you just a few stories about Jesus and how he navigated these politics. The Gospel of Mark opens with Jesus walks along the Sea of Galilee. He sees four fishermen, four people who are being taxed, who are fishing, and he calls them to be disciples of him. These disciples are all anti-Roman, and their names are uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. These are people who are like Jesus. They have worked hard, hard, hard. taxed their whole life. They've had to give 90% of their income to Rome and then charge on top of that to give their money to tax collectors. A few chapters after these people start to follow Jesus and become his disciple, there is another story that unfolds in Capernaum where all these guys are from. And we read about how they go down by the seashore and there was a man collecting taxes on the seashore. Well, why is this man collecting taxes on the seashore? because he is a specialist in taxing fishermen. This is his primary job, is to, as these boats come in, to tax each of them and pocket the money for himself. This guy's name was Matthew. Jesus sees him and says, hey, hey, Matthew, follow me. To which I imagine the four guys who were taxed relentlessly by this guy said, hey, what are you doing? I thought we were starting a movement. This is taking us in the wrong direction. And then, and then, and then, and then first, Jesus is like, eh, why don't we go to Matthew's house for lunch? That whole social isolation protest we have, why don't we, why don't we just call it, call it off? And Jesus and his disciples go to Matthew's house. 
And Matthew's only friends at this point are tax collectors. So they're there with all the people who have betrayed the nation, sold the nation out, sold their friends and family out. And Jesus is there eating food. And this made people so angry because they all agreed we're not going to break this social isolation. So the religious leaders go up, they knock on the door. They're not going to go inside the house. Jesus comes to the door and they say, what are you doing? The only protest we have is social isolation. You shouldn't be eating with these people. And Jesus says to them, people who are healthy don't need a doctor. Sick ones do. I have come to call sinners, not the righteous. A few chapters later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells a parable while he is at the temple, the epicenter of his religion. And he's talking to religious leaders, and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And as he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he says, you want to know who's going to lead the way in the kingdom of heaven? And you assume the religious leaders are like, well, we are Jesus, you know, <laughs> religious. And Jesus says, the truth is tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. And you can imagine they both said, they all said to themselves, what? The people who sold us out? The people who are ruining our lives? The people who are propping up Rome? They're leading the way into the kingdom of heaven? And when you look at the life of Jesus and how he reacted to people, you realize that Jesus was told to avoid these people his whole life. He's told, he's told to love them and fear them and blame them and hate them. And they're the very people that Jesus went and had lunch with and also healed and called to be his disciples. Now, it's here that a lot of Christians like to say, like, well, I mean, he changed their lives. They renounced their ways, and then Jesus hung out with them. Oh, no. That was not the story that is in any of the first three Gospels. Imagine if Jesus went to the people eating at the tax collector's house, and he said to them, hey, I need you to leave your job first, and then I'll eat with you. That's not what Jesus did. Imagine that Jesus called Matthew, and he said, first, Matthew, you need to say you're sorry, and then you can follow me. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus met them where they were, not where they needed to be. And when we ask the question, is our tax collectors Christ-like, and we take that question, we bring it back 2,000 years, a parallel question is, are tax collectors Christ-like? I imagine that if Jesus answered this question, Jesus would say, all I see is how they are like. Wow. And Jesus wouldn't necessarily condemn them, and yet at the same time, some of them started changing. And so if tax collectors are Christ-like, what does that mean for us in the year 2024? Well, when I think about tax collectors and why Jesus went and hung out with these people and validated them, I believe that Jesus was convicted with some principles. These principles included that every human being bears the image of Christ. It's given to people, it is not earned. And as Jesus would say probably, I believe today, he would say, no matter how good you are, you cannot earn the image of God. Which also means that no matter how bad you are, you cannot lose the image of God. When I think about the, the condemnation that I participated in that's gone on for far too long within the Christian church of the LGBT community, there's something that really strikes me when I hear Christians talk about this. It's like Christians want to, want to insist when they condemn LGBT folks that not everyone is made in the image of God. Why are we telling people this is our God? If God is truly great and universal and infinite, then everyone is made in the image of God, and this God makes no mistakes. Yes. And as Christians, one of our most important tasks is to affirm the image of Christ in everyone. Amen. So Warren asks the question, is the Christian nationalist political movement Christ-like? And before we answer, I want to ask just one last question, which is, are Christian nationalists today significantly worse than the tax collectors of yesterday? No. Is the Christian nationalist political movement Christ-like? Yes. If tax collectors are Christ-like, then so are the people of the Christian nationalist political movement, even though I have no problem standing up here and saying, it is a sin to participate in this movement. They are always Christ-like, and we can never 
take that image from them. Now, it's possible that Warren meant to ask the question this way, which is, does the Christian nationalist political movement act like Jesus? Well, my answer to that question is no. But, do you? Because what did Jesus do toward tax collectors? He didn't say, well, I need you to be like me in order for me to talk to you. He didn't say, I need to know where you stand with your votes before I enter your house. He didn't say, why don't you look like me and then we'll talk. Jesus went straight to tax collectors' homes and ate with them. Jesus said, I will be with you when no one else will. Jesus was the man where he could. And if Jesus was part of paradox, I have a feeling he would welcome them into our church. And not like a, you need to change before you can be part of this. No. As they are. As Christians, one of our most important tasks is to affirm the image of Christ in everyone. And this raises the question, why? Why did Jesus validate all of these tax collectors who sold out friends and family and broke relations for political views? Why did Jesus do this? I think it's because Jesus believed that everyone was capable of change. I think that Jesus believed that things could get better. And were his methods perfect? I don't think so, but they're pretty close. And yet when we talk about what it means to follow Jesus, it's not pointing at other people and saying they're the problem. It's, do we have to invite them over? And if this makes you uncomfortable, I want you to know it makes me uncomfortable too. But that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not allow you to say, I have done enough, and therefore I don't need to grow anymore. The gospel always invites you into greater love every day of your life. When I think of the concept of heaven, I often hear Christians talk about heaven. And part of the thing that really excites them about heaven is they finally get to get rid of all the people that don't think like them. And when Christians say, like, I can't wait for us to get to heaven because, oh, then those people aren't there, it impacts how we live today. Because if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't have to learn to love them because they won't be part of eternity. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a gospel that is up in the clouds. It's down here in the dirt. It's living with imperfect people. It's trying to navigate these very slim social norms and trying to understand how do you love people who have sold you out? How do you love them they're unlovable? How do you embrace people who have made your life hard? And this gospel will always, always, always challenge you and cause you to think about how you can become a more loving person. And yes, I can stand up here and condemn Christian nationalism as a sin and own it. And at the same time, the idea that we then isolate them or say we don't ever have to talk to them or we don't need them in our lives anymore or they can't be part of the church, church that is anti-Jesus Christ. And this is a challenging notion. And this is why so many people were furious for, with Jesus for eating with tax collectors. My friends, I understand this a challenging teaching this morning, but I hope you will see it as an invitation into greater love. My friends, may you affirm the image of Christ in everyone. May you value the truth and denounce falsehoods. May you find ways to love and include your enemies, and may you never give up on the idea that people can change for the better. Amen.